Howdy, how's it going? My name's Davy Shappy, and I've decided to make this whole review every adventure thing an annual occurrence. One, because I run three games a week on my Patreon server, and so my opinion changes as I have an in-depth experience with a particular book. And two, because Wizards of the Coast releases so many new adventures per year that my last video was outdated literally as soon as I posted it. So, without further ado, remember that this is all my opinion, kiss your DM if you enjoyed one of the adventures I dislike, with tongue if it's Strixhaven, and if you think that you're getting actual numerical scores out of me, you haven't been here before out of ten. But with that out of the way, let's begin. LAMOP! Still an introductory adventure, still one of the best there is. Lost Minds of Pendelver, that's singular, there's only one mine. Gets new players through all the experiences a D&D player should have. Riding a caravan, killing goblins, foiling an evil wizard dude's plot, the only thing this game doesn't have is a tavern. The one thing that I'd change if I were you is that once the players go through the second dungeon and come back to Vandalin, the players will almost always get bored of the plot and want a quick conclusion, so maybe snip Thunder Tree into the Rune Keep and just skip straight to the Lost Mine. Four out of ten. Todd! I'm grouping Tyranny of Dragons together into one adventure because I cannot be paid enough to talk about Horde of the Dragon Queen anymore. Tyranny of Dragons is a bad adventure, everyone knows that, but what makes it so bad is the railroading and the lack of safety protocols for the inevitable moment that your party goes off the rails. The first half is a long caravan ride that will make you want to scream, the second is a series of fetch quests throughout the Sword Coast that are marginally better by merit of being isolated dungeon crawls, but it's offset by dropping a dating sim into your lap featuring the most temperamental world leaders I've ever seen. Nobody likes you, Braun Anvil. Go away. 4 out of 10. Pokta! I have not played Princes of the Apocalypse, and the only reason why that would change is if someone says a sentence never been uttered in English, namely, I want to play Princes of the Apocalypse. 4 out of 10. Uta! Unlike Pota, I have actually ran this one in between now and my last video, and I have to say, I really like it. It's linear, but it lies by having NPCs just suggest where to go next and then treating it like the players came up with the idea, and the colorful cast of characters makes the otherwise dingy stony caverns fill with life. I would recommend killing those characters, though, because not only does running so many NPCs give me schizophrenia, but the players will no longer have to fear their own deaths if they're scared that I'll take away their beloved Mushroom Boy. Easy characters to kill are Darendil, Ront, and Jim Jar because none of them have to do with anything and half of the other cast members will die at their own scripted times anyway. 4 out of 10. Koss! Or some say Cosm. This adventure slaps you and you will feel it. Everybody knows this is good, I don't need to tell you. 4 out of 10. STK! Okay, it's 7 months later and I can definitively say that wow, I do not like this story. The adventure aspect is fine, but I'm getting really tired of giants showing up to tell the party that something important is happening and then leading them directly where they need to go because they are the protagonists and all of giant kind apparently knows that. I've gotten over it by having most giants simply say, hey, I'm going this way, and then not refuse the players joining because they're small folk and who cares what they do. But the wizard man at the very beginning who parks his tower in front of the characters and says, get in losers, save in the world, can only be solved by instead saying that he's senile and kidnapping the party for no reason. Also, about 10 locations on this map tell you to buy another book if you want information about them, and the joke's on them because I already did. 4 out of 10. Tiffity Yippee! Tales from the Awning Portal did not need to exist, but they did it for us. I only played half of the adventures, but all of them were like going back in time and running through hack and slash nothing burgers, in the best way. There was no greater story, just go in, disrupt the local populace, and get treasure. Looking at all these modern stories, it's easy to get lost in the weirdness, but I enjoy having this to fall back on and think of fond memories. 4 out of 10. Whoa! Duh -huh. I love this module, but only when it's being ran. Which is a weird sentence to say, but what I mean by that is every DM will put their own spin on Dragon Heist that turns it into the perfect representation of their DMing style. And that's all to do with the mountains of city lore that the book sprays at you without actually working it into the story. Unfortunately, without the DM, this story doesn't work, and Chapter 2 is just a gaping hole of nothing actually happening because the designers forgot to put that level in the game. The replayability aspect that Dragon Heist was marketed as is silly. No one is playing the same adventure twice that they can help it, but it leaves me with plenty of things that I can break off and stick into one big Franken game, and it even comes with my favorite D&D character, Jarl Axel, who wasn't made into a card for MTG, and I'm still salty about it. 4 out of 10. Whoa! Dot mm? Punch stuff, loot stuff, and go down a level and do it again. Dungeon of the Mad Mage is surprisingly versatile in its setting, and players will never know what lies below the next dungeon. It's unfair to say that this is a combat simulator, but that's still the main draw, so be prepared for the DM to forget what party balance is and just throw whatever the book tells it to at you. Sad face for those of you who were looking for a sequel to Dragon Heist, because you won't find it here. There's like two characters that are tangentially related to the city, and you can have the adventure take place anywhere you want, because it's just a big hole. 4 out of 10. Goss! Ghost of Salt Marsh is my favorite of the three compilation albums, and that's because with the water comes an eerie mystical feel that is somehow inherent to the life of a sailor. Earlier adventures are much more simple than the later ones, which are complicated, gimmicky, and so much fun, and I do appreciate that this book tries its hardest to give any reason for these adventures to be connected, even if it doesn't lead anywhere. This praise is offset, however, by the fact that despite this being the water level of D&D books, there are no adventures that actually take place on the sea because Wizards of the Coast is afraid to get wet. 4 out of 10. But good dia. My opinion of Baldur's Gate changes with the wind. On one hand, I love the Mad Max setting and the badass over the top action that comes with tearing through the wasteland on the back of an infernal hell machine, but on the other hand, I find the plot to be a series of boring fetch quests where you have to go here to help this guy, but he says that he can only be helped if you go here and do this thing, but to do that thing, you have to go here and help this guy, and this guy can only be helped if you go here and do this thing, and what were we here to do again? 4 out of 10. Id! Ratfum. It's been seven months, and I'm still not out of ten towns. The cold is creeping in from all sides. We hear drums. Drums in the deep. They are coming. 4 out of 10. 
Come. The last of the compilation books was created for nerds who like to read books, and as a nerd whose job it is to read all kinds of books, I can say that this adventure is neat. The mysteries aspect is kind of simple. Most of the riddles are solved by walking forward and waiting for the answer to appear in a dashing cape, but the atmospheric nature of most of the adventures is one that I enjoy subjecting my players to. Four out of ten. Twee, but twee. The Wild Beyond the Witchlight is my new favorite adventure. Everything I like about D&D is wrapped up in a nice little bow and delivered to me with a note reading from your favorite people. The adventure is another one that pretends to be open world, but then pulls off its hood and reveals itself to be a carnival ride, but you never really notice it because every character you meet is packed full of so much creativity that you could write a book for each and every one of them as the main character. When it was coming out, some people were turned off by the combat is optional tagline that Wizards of the Coast used to market it, and those people are dumb. Putting more effort into making every encounter solvable by wits instead of fists is exactly what the Feywild needed. And even if your party has only one brain cell to share, they can still just punch their way through every problem they come across if they so choose. It's combat optional, not combat is missing. 4 out of 10. Psst. A cock. I made an entire video about why I don't like this module. It's so bare bones that I can see through its ribcage, and I don't have enough crunch bars to fill its malnourished body. I'll link to that video in the top right. See? We just moved. That's called an annotation. But I do want to take a moment to express my annoyance that I can't express my annoyance at Strixhaven without a bunch of boomers crawling through their screens to come shake my hand because they think I'm one of them. Just so we're clear, I hate Strixhaven because the mechanics and story are lazy, not because the stairs are wheelchair accessible. One of the only fleshed out things in the adventure was the dating simulator, and I like that every adventure is trying to do new things. After 45 5e adventures of traditional fantasy, I'm fine if a book tries something new, as long as it is trying, which Strixhaven isn't. It's not because it's too PC, that argument doesn't become less cringe because you've played the odds and now one of the adventures is bad, they just tried and to make a time skip narrative because they didn't know what they were doing. Stop using me for your confirmation bias. 4 out of 10. Overall, D&D is picking up the pace with its book releases, and three of the adventures of 2021 show that Wizards of the Coast is really throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks. Some of it does, some of it doesn't, but just like how Curse of Strahd set the bar for what is acceptable to put in a book, the last few adventures have been all kinds of craziness, and I'm excited to see what the future holds. Do I think that Wizards of the Coast is putting out books too quickly? No, are you crazy? I grew up on 3.5. Do I think that the overall quality of the adventures is worse than before? Considering the first adventure was Tyranny of Dragons, no. And will I eventually start reviewing other systems games as 5e becomes less and less interesting? Mmm, maybe. But that'll about do it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to leave a like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, check out all my social media in the description below, and maybe support me on Patreon because I still can't afford any ratings other than a 4 out of 10. But yeah, Davy out.